Good evening. Let's stand together tonight and let's sing Your Grace is Enough. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace. Grace 
that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. This last song we do tonight, King of Kings, what a wonderful message. Praise the Father, the Son, the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Let's sing together. In the darkness we were waiting without hope. Without a lie, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father. Praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, to reveal kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of peace. The morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. Pray the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of The church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, 
In this freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory Majesty Praise forever to the King of kings Sing that chorus one last time here Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that you have poured out on us. Lord, thank you for the message that we received through your word, dear Lord, of the, the one who was given for our, paid the price for our sins, Lord, and raised from the dead on the third day. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word tonight and draw us closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, make your way to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter two. <clears throat> uh, before we before we get started tonight, I, I want us to stop and, and have a, a word of prayer together. Um, Steve Bodier is in uh, ICU down in Conway. Uh, his kidneys have not been functioning correctly um, a, at all, and so the the issue that Steve has had is uh, probably brought on by worry for Kay. And uh, he's not been eating, uh, not been drinking like he should, and uh, he's just really been concerned uh, about <clears throat> the tumors that she has and what they're going to do and, you know, how she's going to be. And uh, in, in doing that, he's still been taking his medication, but he's not been eating and drinking. And so that medication has just kind of set there, and it's not worked its way through his system. And so that's what's caused uh, the issues of, of where he's at um, right now, and it's not good. It's not good. If something doesn't change, uh, then, you know, we know the outcome, and, and it's, it's not good. But it depends on how you look at it. If he knows the Lord, we know where he's going, but uh, certainly right now, Kay does not need that, <clears throat> does not want that, and uh, told me on the phone this afternoon, we're not going to have that. I said, yes, ma'am. So that settles that. But uh, anyway, we are going to pray for, uh, for Steve, and also uh, Brenda Lang's sister uh, did pass away. And uh, so uh, it, that's a that's a blessing. Uh, we was it was to the end there, uh, but she did pass away. And she knew the Lord. We know where she's at. There's comfort and great peace in that. But still, there's a family right here, uh, still in the midst of holidays. It's lost lost another uh, another loved one. And uh, I mentioned it on the call out the other day. <clears throat> but uh, uh, Carol Calvert's lost several in in his family as well. We we'll remember that family. Uh, if y'all, it's, it's tough to lose you know, multiple people, but especially right here around the holidays. And so uh, we want to remember uh, Steve for sure tonight and, uh, and uh, also Brenda's family and Carol's family as well. But special prayer request for, for Steve. Now, I'll do a call out a little later to everyone else in the church uh, to be sure that we're all praying. But uh, uh, going to be some rough days ahead, uh, even if he gets better. Now, let me tell you something good real quick before we pray. I want to lift you up a little bit, uh, Jody Corpier, and I know not everybody knows Jody, uh, but his wife Jennifer was here this morning with the kids, and uh, Jody's doing good, he's doing really good, and uh, y'all, he had a stroke and was non-responsive, uh, it, it was not good at all, and so uh, that is a miracle that has happened, uh, and uh, she said, she told me this this afternoon after after church was over, she said, Jody looked at her uh, and said, you know all that stuff? He said, he's been saying stuff a lot just for everything. He said, all that stuff doesn't mean anything right now. Doesn't mean a thing right now. And so, you know, how true that is and, and how sad it is that sometimes we have to have that reminder, you know. Uh, but God's doing some work there. And so uh, we're grateful for that. Praise the Lord. So he, he did a miracle this week. 
He can continue to do a miracle this last week. He can continue to do a miracle this next week. And, uh, you know, sometimes we gloss over that, but don't miss the miracles that God's doing. God's still working. God's still moving. So uh, let's pray for, uh, for, for Steve and, and, and especially and for uh, the Lang family and also uh, for the Calvert family. Father, we love you. Lord, we just pause just for a moment to lift up all these in need. And, Father, we pray for uh, comfort for these these two families, one that has just today lost loved ones. Uh, so, Lord, we pray that you'd walk with them through this. We know you will, Father. You've been so good to comfort us. And in our times of need, we know that you'll comfort them. But, Father, we just pray uh, for those families. Lord, we lift them up. <clears throat> now, Lord, especially for Steve in this moment, Lord, he needs you. He needs your touch. And so, Lord, we're praying that you would touch him. Father, we pray that you would heal him. And, Father, I pray that even before the service ends, Lord, that I'll get a text or a phone call that he's doing much better. Lord, we praise you for uh, what you did this last week with Jody. Lord, I, I know exactly where he was. And, uh, Lord, I know where you've brought him. And so, Lord, we give you praise and glory for it. And, Father, we pray that you would continue uh, to work in his life, to rehab him, Lord, get him back home with his kids and his wife and, and family. And, Lord, I pray that you'd use this for your honor and for your glory. And, uh, Father, we pray that in everything that happens, both good and bad. Father, you are the God who gives. You are the God who takes away. And, Lord, even in that, we will praise you. And so, Lord, we're not down and distraught tonight. Lord, we know where our help is. Father, we're just looking up to it. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd meet these needs. And, Father, in this year, in this church, Father, I pray that you would meet every need that we have. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us to give you praise, honor, and glory for everything that you're doing in this place and among these people. And Father, this year, help us to be a light in this community. Father, use us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, as you can tell, I've still got this whatever it is. Uh, Miss, Miss Doris asked me, she said, you didn't say a word for the year. And I said, no, ma'am, I didn't. I said, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of claim, you know, I don't use that terminology real often. I'm going to claim well. That's what I want to be is well. I just want to be well and get rid of this, this stuff. Anybody else got this stuff going on, the nasal, whatever it is, sinus, you know, the 70 degree, 24 degree, you know, the wet, the cold. It's just been crazy, hasn't it? We set records in the state of Arkansas this year for the warmest Christmas in the history of how long they've been keeping records. And so... Uh, that's where we were, and uh, we may set records for cold as well. I, I, it, I know it's just in the 20s, and I, that's cold. And don't get me wrong, that's cold, but I know we've, we've had colder. But I'm going to tell you, this morning when I got up and I stepped outside, I thought this is the coldest I've ever felt in my life, you know, <laughs> from last night to today. You know, 64, I think, 65, whatever the temperature was yesterday to, I don't know. My phone said it felt like 9. It was lying. It felt like negative nine this morning is, is what it felt like. Let me tell you also, uh, <clears throat> I've already gotten a phone call of apology. The Herods, you know, they sit right here uh, up toward the front, you know, and they're all like I am. They're real tall. And so when they get up and they all leave at the same time, you know, I, I told Summer, I said, when y'all got up to leave, I thought, well, I'm just saying read the Bible. I don't think I've said anything <laughs> that would run a whole family off, you know. They had gotten a text from Kay needing help with Steve, and so that's why they all got up, and she just apologized. And I said, no, you, you know, I, when they got up to leave, I was preaching on good works. You, you remember that? They went to do a good work, and so uh, that's exactly what, what needed to happen. But I thought that was so funny when they got up. Y'all looked at them, too, and thought, well, what did he say? I mean, he's just saying, read your Bible. This is really not a, a harsh sermon, sermon at all. All right, so I want to talk to you tonight about two kingdoms. And, and there's really only two kingdoms in this world. There are those who are saved. There are those who are lost. There's only two types of people in this world. There's not Baptists and Assembly of God and Presbyterian and Catholics. There's those who are saved, and there's those who are lost. In the Baptist church, there are those who are in the Baptist church who are saved. There are those who are in the Baptist church who are lost. And we've got people in the Baptist church who are lost, who don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, and it... It, it blows my mind how many times, especially in, in this church for sure, because I know what's said in this church, how many times you hear me say it's about a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with Jesus. If you're working your way to heaven, it won't work. I mean, you know, I don't know how plainer I could make it, and yet 
there will be people who will live and die in this church who do not have a relationship with Jesus. How sad that is. When God looks on this world, he only sees two types, those who are saved and those who are lost. In Matthew chapter 2, this is the story. If you're looking there, you see this is the story of the wise men. This is the story that surrounds the Christmas story. We place the wise men uh, there at the cradle, there uh, at the manger. Uh, That's really historically not how it happens. You know, I think I told the men in our prayer breakfast this last Tuesday, I I told them, I said, you know, I don't know that it's right or wrong. I just know that's how we do it. And you know there was only three, right? We, you don't know that. No, nobody knows that. Uh, we, we place three there because there's three gifts. Uh, but we have no idea how many wise men came. It could have been a hundred of them. It could have been, uh, it could have been, anyway. It, it was men, so it had to be more than one, right? But we have no idea how many it was. No idea. But not even totally certain where they came from uh, we know they came from the east and yet it's a part of what we have made traditionally the Christmas story it's worshiping the baby Christ or the toddler Christ which is probably historically more what he was he was probably somewhere between the ages of two and four according to most Bible historians, all right? But we don't know exactly when it was, but we place it there around the Christmas story. And you say, well, it's January the 2nd. It is January the 2nd, but if you are reading through the Bible, and if you're reading through the Bible as I am, you've got Old Testament reading, and you've got New Testament reading. You've got Genesis, and you've got Matthew. Today was Matthew chapter 2, and so that's why we're studying here in Matthew chapter 2. I can't promise you every week we'll, you know, study a scripture uh, that's in that reading that I'm doing, but, but I can tell you tonight we are, because that's where we are. Matthew chapter 2, the two different kingdoms, the kingdom of this world. Herod, if there's ever been a man that would illustrate the kingdom of this world, Herod is your guy. He's your guy. No matter of fact, most uh, kings, governors, princes in this day would represent the kingdom of this world. You read your Old Testament, and you'll see even in the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, they'll have good king, bad king, bad king, good king, bad king, bad king. Kings that are uh, fixed on God the Father and kings that are fixed on this world. It's easy to see how it can happen. We talked about it in our Sunday school class this morning, that when you have all power and you have all control and you have all authority, and everyone looks at you and says, that's the man. He's the one who's seated on the throne. It would be very easy for pride to creep in. How do I know? Well, I don't have that type of authority. I don't have anyone who looks at me and says, that guy, he's the man. And yet, in my own life, pride can creep in. And I see it in my own heart. And so, yeah, you put me on the throne and everybody bowing down to me. Yeah, yeah, I can see very easily how pride could set in. And it happened to almost every king, but certainly it happened to Herod. The Bible says that when these wise men come, King Herod heard about this in verse 3, that, and he was deeply disturbed, and all, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, Jerusalem was disturbed and stirred and wondering because they had heard trickling through out the countryside that the Messiah had come. They had been told, you remember, shepherds in the field saw the great light and heard the angels, whether they sing or said, I don't know. The Bible says they said, but you worry about if they sing or not. And here they are, and they tell the shepherds, and the shepherds come and worship the baby Jesus, and then they go out. And if historically it is correct between two and four-year-old, three-year-old Jesus here, then there's been a few years. There's been months that have passed, and and no doubt word would spread throughout the countryside, hey, I think the Messiah's come. And no doubt there are those in Jerusalem who are of the religious side. They are beginning to look and study. Well, now, wait a minute. Now, it does say he'll come uh, in Bethlehem. And so he had caused to stir just because of his birth. And so Herod is disturbed, the people are disturbed, but Herod's disturbed for a different reason. 
He's disturbed for a different reason. Now, the people are disturbed because the people, the Israelites, if he is the Messiah, in their mind in this moment, he's going to set them free from Roman oppression, and they're excited about that. They expected a warrior to come with a sword and to draw blood. That's what they expected. They expected a king. Now, they got one, but a different type of king, right? And we know that. But Herod is disturbed because he's heard the same rumors that the Jews have. When the Messiah comes, he'll overthrow Rome. We'll be out of this oppression. He'll set us free. If there's anything that Herod did not like, it did not, he did not like anything or anyone that might come against his throne. He was placed as a governor uh, over Galilee at the age of about 25. It's a very high position for a young man, wouldn't you agree? And so from the age of about 25, he began to work his way up the ladder, so to speak. The Romans were really hoping that Herod could be the one who could kind of control and settle the Jews down who lived in the area there in Galilee when he was placed over them. In 40 B.C., the Roman Senate named him King of the Jews. It was a title that, by the way, the Jews did not like. And so when Herod would hear that this one is coming and hear that they would claim him to be king of the Jews, no wonder he didn't like him. No wonder he was concerned about him. Herod had a few things that this world has. One, he was preoccupied with his power. He was preoccupied with his power. Man, he was consumed by his power. Someone has written that if Herod uh, was addicted to power and power has been described as an ultimate human obsession. Someone has said that if it were, uh, if Herod were an alcoholic and power were an alcoholic beverage, Herod would have passed out on the floor drunk with it day after day after day. He he loved the idea of power. By the way, most Romans did. They loved the idea of having power and having charge. Can we just be honest? Y'all, it's just between us, but most politicians like it too. Right? I mean, we get it. They're, they're politicians. They like power. They like control. They like to be in charge. Here his life was ruled by his power. Three words. Capable, crafty, and cruel. That's who Herod was. He was capable, and he was crafty, and he was cool. Herod was extremely capable in what he was asked to do. In other words, he could get the job done. Soon after becoming king, he wiped out several bands of guerrillas who had terrorized the countryside and <clears throat> used subtle, subtle di- diplomacy to make peace accords with many who were comp- competing for who could be in control. When you think about peace, Herod, if he were king in the Middle Eastern region, could probably bring peace. He was that kind of guy. He could get the job done. Now, I'm not talking about ethics. We're not talking about right and wrong here. We're just talking about getting a job done. Herod was the kind of guy who could get the job done. Whatever he's asked to do, he could do. He pretty much had no barriers. Over the years, he killed many people. He killed his brother-in-law. He killed his mother-in-law. He killed two of his sons. He even killed a wife once. That's Herod. Herod is not a good guy. Herod is a very, very bad human being. When you think about Herod, uh, you need to think about Hitler. I mean, that's the the type of person that he was. He would stop at absolutely nothing to have what he wanted to have. The great historian Josephus called Herod barbaric. Another writer dubbed him as a maniac. That's the kind of guy Herod was. He was preoccupied with his power. And the more power he got, the more preoccupied he became with his own power. Number two... He was preoccupied with his possessions. Now, again, we're talking about who Herod was, but we're talking about who earthly people are, too. People without Christ, they're preoccupied with their possessions, what they have, as Jody told Jennifer, that stuff. That stuff doesn't mean a thing when you get sick and you're in the hospital, and he's, he's right. But people without Christ, people outside of the church, are preoccupied with what they have. Herod not only was he preoccupied with what he had, but he wanted it all. I mean, he wanted everything. He, he, he just wanted more and more and more. Herod wanted everything that a Roman Caesar could have. He built seven palaces and seven theaters on which seated 9,500 people. 
He even built stadiums for sporting events in that day. Listen, the largest could seat 300,000 people. We're not talking about small places. We're not talking about the gymnasium down here at Westside School. We're, we're talking about large, large event centers, and of its day, there were no kind like it. It was amazing what Herod was able to do. He loved his possessions. He also loved his prestige. He loved what people said about him. He liked for people to uh, bow down to him. He wanted to build a great impression among those around him. He was a politician of politicians. Man, he was on top, and he was staying on top, too. He would kill you, and he would kill your family. He would kill everyone in the region, if that's what it took, to stay in power and to keep his prestige. Some say he was a smooth talker. He had an ability to kind of win over his opponents by just talking to them, by his language and the things that he would say. History records that several of his ten marriages were prestige-oriented and politically motivated. He once married the daughter of a leading rival in order to gain prestige and power over the rival. Not only was he had a preoccupation with possessions and prestige, but he was pretty good at paranoia, too. You ever been around someone who is an addict? I mean, a real addict. I, I don't mean someone who, who has a drink of alcohol every so often, but someone who is an addict. They have to have that fix. They have to have that drug, whatever it is. They have to have it to live. They get paranoid. And the harder the drug, the more paranoid the mind. I mean, everybody will be after them. I, I remember we had a guy, <clears throat> he, he, he died. I mean, it, the, the drug wound up killing him several years ago. But he had come through this church. He was not a member here, but he had come through this church. And he had been saved. He had come through the other side. He had done so well. And yet, literally, when, when he died, he had had a relapse. He was back on drugs. He died in the middle of the woods, scared to death that someone was coming after him. And there were people coming after him, trying to help him, trying to find him, trying to help him. And he literally would run from them when he would hear their voice because he was paranoid that they were coming after him. And when you think about that type of addict, remember, we said Herod is a guy who's addicted to power. He's, he's addicted to his possessions. He's addicted to his prestige, and he's paranoid over his kingdom. He's scared to death somebody's going to take it from him. Now, when you have that type of power and you have that type of control, it seems odd to me that you would be that cotton-picking paranoid that somebody's going to come overthrow you. You have all the power in the world. You, you, you have people at your beck and call. Why are you so paranoid that someone's going to come and overthrow your kingdom? And yet he was. He was paranoid. An enemy had poisoned Herod's father, who was king himself. And in knowing that, Herod was scared to death that someone was going to take his life as well. Historians tell us that he went to great lengths to make sure that a secret ingredient was never ended up in his soup too. When he became king, he commissioned tens of thousands of slaves to build over 10 emergency fortresses all heavily armed and well-provisioned. In addition, he established an elaborate network of spies. Anyone who had a plot to dethrone Herod, Herod could sniff it out quick. He's paranoid. Somebody's always coming after him. I don't know if you know it or not, but that's not a real good way to live. It's not. It's not a good way to live. When you're paranoid, when you're worried, when you're concerned, when all of your your view is on your possessions, when all of your view is on your power, when all of your, your view and the, the, the way that you see yourself is what others see in you. You don't see God's opinion of you. All you see is what others see in you. It is a life of worldliness. It is a life of worry. And it is a life that has no end to the work to keep it. When I look at Herod, I see this world. I see people outside of Christ. People who don't know Jesus. Unfortunately, I see some of these attributes in some who know Christ. But I see all of them in those who don't. People who don't know Christ, man, they're working their way up the ladder. It doesn't matter what the ladder is. It doesn't matter how high it is or how great it is. They're, they're working their way up the ladder. They're, they're 
uh, totally obsessed with their things, their stuff, the things of this world. They see their value in their things. They see their value in a new car or a new truck or a new house or a new boat or new clothes or whatever that possession is that is of great interest. They see value in what others say. Now listen, I do too. I do too, but not to the point that I devalue myself based on what everybody... If I did that as a preacher, can you imagine? Y'all ever had grilled preacher for lunch on Sunday afternoon? We, we used to have it at my house when I was growing up, so I know what, what is said, and I know the critique and, and all those things. Man, if I, if I went around worried about that, and I, and I don't want you to say bad things about me. I hope you can say good things about me, but my life, my, my life value is not found in what you say about me. It's found in what my father says about me. And your life value should never be in what the preacher says, but in what the father says. You know, I say this a lot at funerals when I'm preaching over someone who has lived a godly life, and I can say great things about it. Norman McPherson was the, the last one, and then uh, before that, who was before that? We had a funeral here at the church. Earl Ezel. Earl Ezel was another one. And I could say great things about that. Some things that I knew about both men and some things that I did not know about both men, but I've heard from others. Other people have said great things about both of those men. And I make the statement up there that hopefully one day when you're laid in a box like this or when we're here to quote-unquote celebrate your life, when that moment comes, can a preacher stand in the place where I'm standing and say the same things about you that I'm able to say about these men? And I think that's good. But who cares what the preacher says? I want to know what God's going to say, right? Herod, his problem the world's problem is that they are literally fulfilling what Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says, that the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, uh, carousing, and anything similar. And the Apostle Paul says, I tell you these things in advance. As I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is a very well-known Bible teacher that I will not name because I like most of what he has to say. But on this particular text, here's what he says. He says that what the Bible means when the Apostle Paul made this statement is not talking about salvation or loss of salvation, not having salvation, unsaved, lostness. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is the crowns you'll receive when you get to heaven. Um, <clears throat> this guy has a doctorate degree, Ph.D., matter of fact. Pretty smart guy. Pastors a really large church, but on that issue, he is wrong. That is not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that people who practice these things, they will not go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. I was preaching in a church <clears throat> probably the first year I was I had surrendered to preach, and, and um, y you know, it was, a, it was a larger church, larger than I was used to at that time preaching in. I was preaching, and, and, and everybody, you know, the altars got full, and, and you know, my family was there because it was in Camden, which was a lot of my family lives there, and so they were there to hear me preach. We were going out to lunch, and so after church, I was filling in for the pastor who was out of town, and so uh, after church, I went back to the back, you know, and the pastor wasn't there, so I shook everybody's hand, you know, and all that as they... As they walked out, and there was an older gentleman who came up, and you could tell he was kind of waiting to be last. Now, sometimes that's good, but most time it's not. And so I, I saw it. I saw it going on. My family had kind of gathered around, and I was kind of hoping that I could leave before he got there. And it, it didn't work. He came right in the middle of my family and acted like a fool. He was angry. And I found out later on he was angry because he had a as either son or a grandson who was living a homosexual lifestyle. And I had made the statement from the pulpit that, and I read, it was either Galatians or Ephesians, it says it in both, that these people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. They will not go to heaven when they die. And he wanted to know where that was in the Bible. Now, again, early on, tactfulness was not my spiritual gift. It's still not at times. I can be very untactful if I have to be, I, but I have to be pushed to get there. Most of the time, I'm very tactful and, 
and uh, not politically correct, but kind, you know, nice and happy and smiling. But at that time, I wasn't at all, you know. I just assumed that if you're going to get anybody saved, you had to beat them up with that Bible a little bit before you could get them saved. I was wrong, by the way. But when this guy made that statement, I just looked at him. I said, you don't think that's in the Bible? He said, no. I said, well, you, you, know, you want to know where it's at. You seem to be so smart in the Bible. Why don't you go look it up and you come back and tell me? Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but when a man's angry and you say that to him, well, he's livid then. You know how I know? He, he peeled out in the parking lot, spun gravel all up against the church as he was leaving, and then uh, the next day when the pastor got back, he had a meeting about me and was really angry. And I called the pastor that afternoon. I said, you're going to have trouble when you get back. And I did it, and, and I meant to do it, and I'm sorry, but I did it. And uh, he did have problems, but he did show him where the Word of God does say that. The world is living out works of the flesh. Herod was just doing what his nature taught him to do. Now, he was over the top. There's no doubt about that. He did things that are appalling. There's no doubt about that. Even lost folks would be shocked at some of the things that Herod did, and I understand that. But all he was doing was living out for the world to see what was inside, which is the lack of God. I mean, you, you see me without, the, without God in his life, there's no telling what I'd be. There's no telling where I would be. There's no telling what I'd be doing tonight. No, no telling where I would be and what type of people I would be with in this moment if it wasn't for Jesus. And Herod, all Herod is, is an illustration of what lost folks do. He was known as the butcher of Bethlehem. You can read about it there in chapter 2. If you look down, you remember the wise men were coming, and he calls them in, and he tells them, says, hey, he says, I want you to come back and report to me, and we'll talk about that a little more in just a moment. But the Bible says in verse 16 that then Herod, when he saw that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the male children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because there were no more. He killed them all. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen visual depictions of this massacre, but it's awful. It's awful. It's gory. We, we, we think about abortion, and, and abortion is very heinous, but to go in and kill the babies in the cradles, the toddlers up toddling around, to come in with swords drawn and take their lives, it's just, it's brutal. It, it's almost... You read it, and so you kind of think, but I need to go back and read that again. Massacre of the Innocents is kind of what it's known as, and that's exactly what it was. He went in and took their lives, the, the butcher of Bethlehem. That's who Herod was. He was one bad guy with a wicked, wicked heart. When we walk out into this world, and we're around people, I'm not saying bad people. I'm not saying people like Herod who kill children. I don't mean that. Some will, but not all. We know that. But when we're around lost folks, you can see Herod's heart in them. You can hear. They're not concerned about the things of God. could care less. They're concerned about themselves. They're concerned about the things of this world, consumed by the things of this world. You know, when, when COVID first happened, I believe with all my heart, one of the things that set the world upside down, and let's face it, it turned the world upside down. It was the fear of death. I mean, the, the livid fear of death. People were terrified. And if you didn't know Jesus, you would be too. They're groping at this life. When this life ends for them, it is over. Many of them who are agnostic or who are atheists will say that when I'm gone, I'm gone. It's over. It's over. 
And when you put me in the ground, that's where I am. I'm in the ground. It is over. Now, if we were living only for this life, I'm going to tell you, uh, I would be working very hard to stay in this life as long as I could. And so no doubt that the things of this world can shine and glimmer to those who are without Christ. Now, when you look at the life of Jesus, you look at the total opposite, don't you? I mean, as, as awful as Herod, this quote-unquote king of the Jews was, the, the real king of the Jews was the total opposite. I was asked once in a Muslim country, why did you choose to be a Christian? I like the way the guy put it, too. He was in his Muslim garb. He was Muslim. Why did you choose to be Christian? You see, we get this idea that we're living in the Bible Belt, as I have all of my life. Living here, going to church, raised in church. I'm a Baptist because I was taken to a Baptist church, but that's not true. I'm a Baptist because I studied the other major uh, Christian communities, so I'll put it that way, in, in this area. I studied what the Assembly of Gods believe. I studied what uh, the, uh, the Presbyterians believe and what the Methodists believe. I studied those points that we agree on, but I also studied those points that we don't. And then I studied the Word. I went through every one of them when I was surrendered to preach. I said, you know, if I'm going to be Baptist, I better know why. And just because that's where I was taken may not be right. And as I begin to study our doctrinal statement compared to these other doctrinal statements, I'm Baptist by choice. I choose to be a Baptist. And I like the way the guy said about Christianity because I chose to become a Christian. And it was not because my parents took me to church. It helped. But it's not that if they would have taken me uh, to a Muslim mosque that I would have just been Muslim. No, I would have went to the Muslim mosque as a kid growing up. But at some point, I believe, if you believe the word of God, that the Lord Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, would have wooed me to salvation out of that Muslim mosque. Because it's by his choice that I am chosen. And I'm grateful for that, by the way. I can't fully explain that, but I can tell you this. He spoke to my heart as an eight-year-old boy, and I received Jesus. I chose to receive Christ. And if you're in this room and you know Jesus, it's because you chose to receive Christ. You have a choice. Everybody has a choice. And so the guy said, why are you Christian? Why did you choose to be a Christian? Let me give you some reasons I chose to be a Christian. One, as selfish as... As Herod was, Jesus was selfless. The way that he walked, the things that he did when he was here, everything in his life was without a thought to himself, but it was always about others, always about others. It was always about someone else. Even his relationship with his father was not about him, but it was about a relationship with the father. Which, by the way, if you see the son, he'll always glorify the father. If you see the spirit, he'll always glorify the son. That's the way this thing works. He's selfless in the way that he walked. There's no other religion under the sun that you can say that the leader of that religion is selfless, totally selfless in everything that he did. Secondly, he was sinless. He was without sin. Everything he did was right. He overcame every temptation that I've ever had and every temptation that you've ever had. The book of Hebrews says, so that when you pray, he'll know what to say to you. He'll know how to help you. He'll know how to show you how he overcame. Thirdly, if you look at when he was born, well, it really wasn't Bethlehem. He's always been. Now, I said that to kids on a Wednesday night. Then I had to explain it. <laughs> well, well, where, when was, how was Jesus born? We were talking about well, the, the verse in the book of Psalms that says that God gave birth to the earth. He created the earth. And everything that is had a, had a creator and had a beginning. And then one of them said, well, where was Jesus born? And one of them said, well, you know, it's Bethlehem. And that's true, right? Physically, on this earth, we know that the Lord Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem. He had to be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2, Christmas verse, Bethlehem of Paphratha, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you and be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity and from eternity. So yes, he was born in Bethlehem as a 
man, but on the God side, he's from antiquity. Well, where's antiquity? Eternity. He's from a long ago. He's always been. Revelation 1 and verse 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, the one who is, who was, and who is coming, the Almighty. He's ceaseless. He never ends. He, that's what eternal means. He had no beginning, and he'll have no ending. When they laid him in the grave was not the end. It was not the end. It was not the end of the man because he walked out three days later. We know that. We celebrate that. We just sing about that, right? But it was not the end because he went up and was seated at the right hand of the Father. It wasn't the beginning either in Bethlehem. That's just when we got to meet him face to face. But he's always been. When you start talking about what you will choose to base your life on, a God who's always been, a God who's sovereign, who's over it all, a God who loves me beyond measure, a God who likes me and loves me even when no one else does, a God who will have me at my worst, not at my best, not when I get cleaned up, not 20 years into preaching, no. No, he'll have me at my worst. A God who will hold me even when I walk away from him, even when I live life like hell itself, He'll still hold on to me. He'll still care for me. Doesn't matter what I do, I can't make him love me more or less. Yeah, and it goes further than that. He paid the price so that you wouldn't have to. He took hell for me. I remember in that Muslim country as I stood there talking to that guy, telling him all of that, and I could just see his eyes. It was like I never heard all this. I said, yeah, when you hear about Jesus and him being a prophet, he was. But he was so much more than just a prophet. He was so much more than just a man. I'll tell you another reason I choose to be a Christian. Flip back to chapter 1. Flip back to chapter 1. Look at his line and his lineage. Now, he had to come through the line and lineage of David. And we know that. And we will not have time to go through every name on this list. And aren't you glad? <laughs> but one name just, man, it just stands out like a neon sign. Rahab. Rahab. Who is Rahab? A prostitute. I can't say the word that preachers used to say when I was a kid. It wasn't prostitute. That's who she was. She's in the line and lineage of David. How about Ruth? She's not of the nation of Israel. When you start looking through these names, you'll see names that'll stand out and you say, well, well wait a minute. Wait a minute, that's, that's not, a, not a Jew. How did that work? You would think, you would have thought that the Israel religious leaders of the day could have seen this. There's another name there. David. David. Listen to how the word of God, listen to how Matthew writes it. Then David fathered Solomon, this is in verse 6, by Uriah's wife. doesn't say Bathsheba. We all know who it is, right? We're in the church. We know who it is. It's Bathsheba, but that's not what it says. It's by Uriah's wife. Why does it say that? Why does Matthew write it that way? Why does God say it that way? Because he took sinful man and said the Savior will roll through sinful man so that sinful man will know the Savior has come for sinful man. And I remember telling the Muslim guy that. And he's looked at me. I said, what did Muhammad do for you? He wrote you a book. He wrote you a book. Which, by the way, in his book, Roger can back me up on this, it says to hold this book, the Bible, above every other book in religion. Man, it just blows their mind when you say that. Like, what? Yeah, it does. So what are you going to do with Muhammad's words? If you're going to, if you're going to follow Muhammad's words 100%, then you're going to believe the Bible, and you're going to have to trust Jesus because it's in the Bible. Herod was everything that was against God. 
Jesus was everything that was God. Here's the last point about Jesus. He's limitless in his control. See, he has full control. He doesn't have some control. He has full control. That baby, full control. And I, I, I think I said this in the Sunday school lesson this morning, and I didn't mean to till tonight. But when Jesus makes the statement that no one knows when the Son of Man is coming again, no one knows but the Father, you can, you can talk about this and you can study this on your own if you choose to, and you can be mad at me about this statement. I hope not. But I don't believe that he was saying that the Son does not know when he's coming again. I believe to make that statement, the Son doesn't know and literally mean it the way you read it, then he's not God. I believe when he made that statement, what he was doing was demonstrating that it doesn't matter when the Son comes again. You live as though he could come at any moment because he can in your life and in your world. But I believe Jesus was not part of God, but he was all God. He was all God. I believe he knew he was going to the cross. I believe he knew the very moment he was going to die. He knew the very moment he would be raised from the dead. He knew the very moment he would call the disciples. He knew the very moment he'd walk on the water. He knew the very moment he would heal lame legs and blind eyes. No one ever took him off guard. He knew that he's God. His power is limitless even as a child, a toddler, baby in a manger. I can prove it. Look back in verse 16. The Bible says that then Herod, when he saw that he had been outwitted by the wise men, how was he outwitted by the wise men? He was outwitted by the wise men because they had been told in a dream, don't go back to Herod. Who told them that in a dream? Jesus. Jesus. God did. God did. So even as a baby, he was totally without power. Real quick, to kind of sum it up. Matthew chapter 2 is a wonderful chapter. It's full of a lot of truth. But the thing that stands out to me in this chapter is that you've got Herod on one side, Satan. Then you've got Jesus on the other side, God. Over here with Herod and Satan, you got everybody else who doesn't know Jesus. They're following their father, the devil. They don't even realize it. If they realize it, they'd get saved. And then you've got us over here with Jesus, church. In 2022, it's going to be hard to remember that. So what do we do? We don't get shocked when we see the world doing worldly stuff. We don't sit around and talk for hours on end about how horrible it is, and I can't believe it's this bad, and remember the good old days when it wasn't this bad. You can do that, but I'm telling you, that is a waste. Here's what we need to talk about. How do we go in to this lost world and show Jesus to these people? They're in desperate need. Y'all, people are dying every, every second of every day. We don't have time to waste. People in this area die month after month after month. You hear of someone somewhere, they've died, they've died, they've died. I thank goodness many of them are saved, but many of them are not. And I'm going to tell you, it's tough when you're the preacher at a funeral of someone that you know never accepted Jesus. It's tough. It's not easy. And the only thing that can change them is the church. Holy Spirit. That's it. They need the gospel. Here we are, the second day of 2022. Tomorrow, many of you will go back to work or back to that thing that you call retirement. It impresses me. Y'all stay busier than I do, and you're retired. I don't know how that works. You'll go back. It may not be this week. It, I mean, it may not be tomorrow. It may be more like Wednesday when you go back to school. But you're going to be surrounded by those who do not know Jesus. Find a way to share the love of Christ with them. 
Wouldn't it be good in 2022 if we could say, you know, in 2022, I led more people to Christ than I ever have in any other year of my life. Wouldn't it be great if the second Sunday in 2022, you could bring someone who's lost with you to church that you have witnessed to that week? You know, they say over 85% of lost folks come to church if you just give them a ride. That's all it takes. You come to church, I'll come by and pick you up. Well, I guess. What time are you going to be here? It's not that hard. But it's obvious. The lostness of this world, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. Let me encourage you. This week, not next week, not the week after, not in February, but this week, find someone and share the love of Jesus with them. Invite them to church. And who knows? They just might come. They just might get saved. And their life just might get changed. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, we're so grateful that you've called us to salvation. And Father, we're so grateful that you've called us to yourself. And Lord, so honored to be a part of your kingdom. Father, help us to see the lostness of this world. See those who follow the ways of Herod and many before him and many after that are doing as your son taught us as their father, Satan. Lord, I know that's harsh and maybe not politically correct, but Lord, it's true. Lord, help us to see them as they are dying and going to hell. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his life, his illustration of what it is to live a life totally committed to you. Lord, help us to be a witness this week. Lord, not next week or the next, but this week. Help us to be a witness for your honor and for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. If you need to come, you come as we sing. I'm forgiven because you are forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. forgiven because you are forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can King would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I we do, we will honor him. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. The kidneys are starting to function again, which, by the way, is the prayer. And so God is good.
God is very, very gracious. And so uh, you continue to pray for, for Steve, pray for all these that are hurting, uh, and uh, pray for all the sickness. We got a lot of sickness, a lot of illness. Some is the virus, and some's just sickness and illness of this time of the year. And then some are like Kay, you know, the tumors and everything else. And so it's just uh, major issues uh, going on. You know, it's not really the way you want to go into a new year with a lot of sickness and illness, but it's that time of year where you seem to see it uh, so much. So remember all of these in your prayers. Uh, celebrate recovery tomorrow night, 530. They're celebrating their birthday, so they'll have some refreshments back in the back. And if you've not, huh? In the front, in the front, I'm sorry. In the front, in the foyer. I, y'all, that is so odd to me to say we're going to have refreshments in the foyer, but they are going to have it in the foyer. Uh, so if you've not come to CR and you've been thinking about it, boy, tomorrow night's a great night. You get to eat, you know, it's good. Uh, but uh, the men's prayer breakfast Tuesday morning. Wednesday night, we'll just have one uh, big group here at 6 o'clock uh, for all ages, uh, but nothing for kids, nothing for teenagers that night. We'll start the following Wednesday. If you know a teacher at that school, and you help me to get that word to them uh, that we're not having a wana this Wednesday. So we're gonna be sure we're gonna be sure the school knows, but we need everyone there to know. And sometimes everybody be on the same page, you know, that first day back. And all the word to them, it helps, y'all. It helps. Uh, aren't you glad it's warm in here? Amen. I'm so glad you came tonight. And I uh, hope you have a very, very blessed week. I'll see many of you uh, throughout this week. But if I don't see you this week, I hope you have a great, uh, great week. Anything else needs to be said tonight? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, help for the, uh, the get the decorations down and get them put up uh, from, from Christmas. Christmas time is over. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Man, it was a great Christmas, but oh, I'm so glad when it's done. We, we had, I think, our, is either the third or the fourth one we were at, and I looked at Lisa and said, aren't you sick of Christmas yet? I'm sick of this. <laughs> and I love all these people, but I'm tired of this. Uh, we had a great, great Christmas, but it's nice when it is done. And uh, I'm excited for this year. I have no idea what all the Lord has in store for us this year, but I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to be a part of it. Uh, Y'all pray for the students who are going back to school this week. Uh, Pray for those who are in college who are about to uh, get started on their next semester as well. And they ask for our prayers every single time they're here because, you know, now it matters. It never seemed to matter before, school that is, but now it seems to matter because they're ready to get out and, uh, and get done. All right, anything else? Brother Ron, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please?